There we go. It's one o'clock. It's Wednesday on Gamescom, and I am here with, well, my favorite developer, Subsidian. Of course. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. I'm Brian Hines. I'm the game director of Tyranny. I'm Nick Carver. I'm a systems designer at Eternity. I'm going to... I'm going to... Tyranny. <laughs> Tyranny. <laughs> Tyranny. <laughs> You guys have been, uh, well, most of Turner, you are going to be stuck uh, demoing the game for, for press and media. But mm -hmm. right now, we are going to have a look at character creation, correct? Correct, yes. So uh, you, I'm going to hand it off to you guys. You guys get to uh, introduce it. And I'm going to make sure that all of the audio levels and stuff like that are OK. And uh, keep track of stream chat. So uh, let's get this show on the road, shall we? Sounds good. All right. So go for it, Nick. Uh, so what we're seeing, seeing right now is the actual main menu of Tyranny. This is uh, a piece that uh, one of our uh, artists, Bob <clears throat> Bobby Hernandez, did the painting for this, and it is it looks amazing. We've got uh, great parallaxing going on, like the, the banner waving in the background. It's like really helps set the tone of what the game is from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, create a new game. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Tyranny, uh, just give the basic idea what the game is. It's uh, a world where evil has won, and you begin the game as part of the, the conquering army. You are one of the evil characters who helped suppress the rest of the world, and here's our intro video to give you an idea of the game. For over 400 years, the armies of Kairos the Overlord have swept across the known world. All who stood against them fell before their might. Even the Archons, Women and men of immense power were forced to kneel, chained to the Overlord's will. Now Kairos's final conquest has come to our corner of the world, and two of the Overlord's armies compete for the honor of taking our lands. The elite disfavored, and the teeming horde of the Scarlet Chorus. The voices of Narad Spymaster and Archon of Secrets guides the fierce and undisciplined masses of the Scarlet Chorus. With each battle, the Scarlet Chorus grows stronger as the defeated are given a simple choice. Serve or die. Grave and Ash, Archon of War and the Overlord's most loyal general, leads the disfavored. Though small in number, Kairos's ironclad legion has never met true defeat in open battle. Watching over the two generals is Tunon, the Adjudicator, Archon of Justice, eldest of Kairos's minions. Tunon brings Kairos's laws to newly conquered lands, aided by the Fate Binders, judges and executioners of the Overlord's laws. You were among the youngest of the court of Fatebinders when Kairos's armies came to our lands. How could we have known that the fate of thousands would rest in your hands? So there you go. That's the intro video. Kind of gives you a setup for the game. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna steal uh, control for a bit here and get us into our smaller camera because uh, I'm sure people like that. There we go. And now we're okay. back. Excellent. And in character creation. So obviously the first part of character creation is deciding what your character is going to look like. So with the tyranny, we're focusing much more on a, a human world where we're not a traditional fantasy where there's like yeah. elves and dwarves. It's very much just a humans fighting humans. So one of the ways we're giving you um, ability to create a uh, unique character is giving you access to different body types. You saw as Nick was clicking through that between the different genders, you can actually choose not just gender of the character, yeah. but also like, are you a like more small and petite? Are mm -hmm. you like big and burly and muscular or like tall and skinny? So uh, a couple different body types, and then you can choose different skin tones within that for how your character looks as, as a whole. So we'll go ahead and uh, create a character and then move on. And then additional appearance customizations, you can choose um, what uh, face your character is going mm -hmm. to use. Uh, customize like the hairstyle and facial hair. Well, I mean, for me personally, of course, the most important thing is the beard. Of course. I mean, uh, we're all fond, fans of facial <laughs> hair here. So uh, 
I think uh, beards are an important part of any character's. So, uh, other, otherwise, I can't. I can't commit to the role <laughs> without the proper beard. Do you have a beard you prefer? What? N no, not really. Like I'm also because of my my beard and my hairstyle. I'm used to wh whenever I try and create myself in a game. It never works out. I kind of have to be like either get the guy who's got like a proper beard or get the guy who has like short dreads. So I'm like, I'm fine with at least there being one thing that's kind of like, okay, nice. yes, beard. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we got uh, also, uh, obviously we can choose hair color. Um, also on the screen, you can pick uh, different voice sets for your character. Mm -hmm. So we've got a drop down here where you can pick. All right, let me boost the audio a bit for that. Good work. <sighs> got it. I got it. And then one of the things we're adding from uh, Fraternity that uh, didn't exist in Pillars was the ability to add tattoos to your mm -hmm. character. So we've got several different tattoo patterns for you to choose from that uh, apply to any skin tone, and then you can then uh, change what the actual primary and secondary color yeah. of the tattoos are. Just more customization options for, for characters to, to choose from. And then... Uh, final step of uh, creating your appearance is deciding what uh, portrait your character is going to use. So we have a, a large number of both uh, male and female portraits. This is uh, the portrait style that we've been working on over the, the course of Trinity's development, yeah. trying to something that's kind of unique to what our game is. I think we've hit on a style that's that's, that's beautiful. Uh, really helps convey the game. And like all of our portraits, there's a lot of like, uh, tattered and wear, uh, wear and tear on the actual appearance of the, the characters. Like yeah. trying to sell the idea that this is like, you're not a character who's like coming pristine into the world. You've been in, uh, fighting through combat for, for years, so there's a lot of uh, damage on your, your character starting the game. So, uh, Trisha, with RPGs, you can pick like what your background is. Like, How did you join yeah. Kairos' army to begin with? And This will feed into conversations in the game, as you'll have, based on how you pick your background, you'll have different conversation options available to you in certain situations. So, choosing to be someone who's like a former slave or a pit fighter will feed into different conversations versus like, oh, you were a diplomat and trained in uh, the laws of Kairos' land, so. Is, is this something that you as a character uh, are aware of and it affects your, um, your dialogue choices or do people in the world like kind of sense your backstory or is it just the backstory that you create in game? It usually uh, affects like what choices you have as a mm -hmm. character, that if you're uh, talking with somebody and they're saying something and you have a background as a diplomat, you can yeah. say, now, hold on now. I was part of those negotiations. I know that's not the, not the case. You can call them out on lies and yeah. things like that. Cool. Now, if you're a lawbreaker, you might be able to steal from a shop that you maybe couldn't otherwise interact with in that way. I'm going to be a, I'm gonna be a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, so this uh, character creation is the first point where we start talking about, like, we're a skill-based game. So rather than choosing a class, um, what you're doing during character creation is starting to choose what skills you begin the game yeah. with. Um, so we have several different combat styles. You can start off with like sword and shield or having a thrown javelin and shield. And these different choices of how you want to specialize and customize your character beyond just choosing like what your, your starting equipment is as far as like the actual armor and weapons. Uh, it's also, if you look at um, the right side of the screen, if you scroll down, Nick, um, you see that you start actually getting different skills yeah. that you begin the game with. So this is between uh, these these choices you're making and like, your attributes, and farther on, we'll get to more skill selection. This defines your starting abilities as a character. Mm -hmm. So, um, And then you can also choose additional initial abilities based on your expertise. So we'll start with the guy's uh, sword and shield. That's a good, uh, good starting mm -hmm. character to make. And then... Uh, you get a second cho choice of skill. So we have both a primary and secondary expertise. Um, one of the reasons we did this is because I think I've said on interviews in the past, like I love creating like hybrid characters. So here, if you really want to be the guy who is okay, I'm one-handed weapons. Yeah. That's really my focus. You can choose like to uh, just double down on that and get extra skill in that area, become more effective. Or you can start combining and creating, uh, getting experience in different magical schools yeah. as well, and start mixing and matching those different types of characters. So for this, we'll go ahead and do a, a frost spell character as well. So with this, you start getting with a uh, first set of magical skills and abilities for your character. Uh, you not just have the one-handed weapons, but you also have control frost, which is the skill that determines how effective you are at casting frost spells. Um, and you get a cool magical magical staff as well to go along with it. Sparkly, sparkly, yes. <laughs> uh, 
So again, part of appearance customization, you can pick um, what your primary and secondary tint values on your armor are, just to get your character looking the way you want. Mm -hmm. And then we also have, uh, you can pick a banner for your character. like Because you are a leader in yeah. an army to begin with, we wanted you to have your own symbol, your own heraldry that determines uh, what people would rally to if you were on a battlefield. And this will affect, like, as you're traveling on a world map, your banner will be what actually displays to show your party's location. So this is something you'll see throughout the world. And if you conquer a place and claim ownership of it, your banner will start appearing in that location as well. So uh, this is something you'll see fairly frequently throughout the world. So now that we've got our uh, character's banner selected and appearance, let's go ahead and move on. So naming your character, That's always important. Very important. Buttercup. <laughs> I was so sure you were going to put a space after <laughs> the first bit there, and I was like, oh, no, that's no I mean, thing. the Dreadlord Buttercup. I mean, I mean, it's it's if, if the if the name fits. Oh. Nope, not enough characters. The Dreaded Buttercup. Yeah. Yes, that's an appropriate name for our character creation. Okay, so now that we've... Now that the dreaded buttercup is ready to uh, <laughs> move forward. So we have uh, six different attributes for our characters. Mm -hmm. um, people who have played Pillars are going to be familiar with this uh, type of breakup. The, uh, the goal is to create attributes that any character can find valuable no matter what the build is. So there are no, there are no wasted attributes yeah. for your character. And we begin with a certain number of points that you can spend. Um, you can also reduce an attribute lower if you want to get more points back so that you have more stuff to actually purchase during character creation. And then like on the left of the, uh, the you'll see indicators whether an attribute is recommended for you. Uh, depending on what uh, primary and secondary yeah. weapon expertise you choose will determine what attributes are actually recommended for your character uh, to be most effective in combat. So how, because I'm a, sometimes a stat nerd, how big is the difference then between, say, Quickness 9 and Quickness 12? What does it... So when you mouse over, um, you'll see on the, the right-hand panel, mm -hmm. it will show you the actual, what the effect of uh, a skill is as you're raising and lowering it. So like with Quickness 12, you're reducing your ability and spell cooldowns. So 12 gives you a 6% reduction in yeah. that. So if you go down to a 9, like we had initially, you're actually seeing you're getting an additional 3%. So you're, it'll take you longer for your yeah. abilities and spells to become usable again. Yeah. So uh, none of our attributes are, like an individual point is not punitive with any of our attributes. We don't want it to be at yeah. the point where, oh, you got a debuff and now you feel like your character is now absolutely useless and can't be yeah. viable in combat. So it is actually feasible for you during character creation to bring a stat down lower, below 10, and then use that point to give yourself a benefit elsewhere. It's one of those things that it is... Uh, some people I know never want any stat to be below 10. They just, whenever they see something, it's like, oh, it's not a 10. I have to increase it no matter what. We try to build down system so that you can actually make that choice and your character is not going to be uh, dramatically harmed in any way by doing so. Okay, good. Well, I, I say good, but I'm, I think I'm one of those people that are like, no, can I, can I be this? Can I be this bad? No, no, I can't be this bad. I have to be good at everything. It's uh, just rough. Yeah, it definitely is challenging. <laughs> Uh, so after you've allocated your attributes, um, we go to our skill selection page. So um, as you're choosing your expertises for the primary and secondary, you're getting certain amounts of skill for your character. Here's where you actually have a certain number of points you can allocate across multiple different skills. So you could choose to try and dump them all into a single skill, which uh, during this section you can bring any skill up to 50 ranks of skill at a maximum. Um, it would mean you're very good in that one skill and then yeah. everything else you kind of just have the basics that you would uh, uh, base on your, your attributes for the character. So uh, since we are both com combining one-handed weapons and frost, we'll kind of divide our ranks between uh, those two skills to get those to decent numbers, give us a chance to have good, uh, uh, good attack skills yeah. in game. Mm. And skills also pull some of their starting values from the attributes that you've chosen. So things like if you want to be better at one-handed weapons, it helps to have a higher finesse to be more accurate with your strikes yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and gain more one-handed skill. And you can see uh, when you're mousing over any of the skills in the panel on the right, it shows you how the value is being calculated. So like athletics we're looking at right now, it shows you the base value is 15, which comes from your 10 finesse plus your 12 might. Um, plus you got 
four athletics from being a sword and shield expertise and two from having a soldier background. So those people who want to min-max will well, want to try pick the right backgrounds yeah. and attributes to give them the, the highest possible uh, skill values. Well, I, I part of me always wants to min-max, and then I get to a certain point where I'm like, no, this is too much math. <laughs> <laughs> I just stop. I'm like, oh, I'd love to. I'll just have a sword and shield. Yeah, the one thing with uh, we try to do with our character creation is to give you the, the ability to create the character concept that you really want for your character, but then not make you feel like you've gone so far down the road at the very beginning of the game that you can't experiment and yeah. try new things as you're playing the game. Like one of the great things about our skill system is that as you're playing the game, if you like, we chose us to be a one-handed weapons character. If we find like a really great bow mm -hmm. um, in the game and decide, oh, you know what, this uh, playing with the range character is actually a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be, and you want to decide to switch and focus on that, that is possible in the game. You can definitely just, by picking up the bow and using that moving forward, you can have a very different experience and change the concept of your character based on what you're enjoying about the game, rather than feeling like, oh, I, I chose one-handed weapon at the beginning, I'm stuck with this, I can't make anything else, do anything else throughout the game. Uh, we wanted you to have that freedom as you're, adventure, as you're adventuring through Tyranny to experiment and try new things. Well, ex excellent. I, so now that we've gone through it, what's your... Um, just looking at the dreaded Buttercup, are you, are you, pleased, with your, are you pleased with your character? Uh, this, yeah. Uh, is, um, this is this going to work well? I think that uh, I'm going to be really good with one-handed weapons in melee. I'll probably be casting some frost spells to slow down my opponents. Um, I'm thinking maybe I want to be a little sneakier so I can start off with a frost spell or something from stealth and then be able to move in with melee afterwards. Uh, but yeah, no, Dreaded Buttercup looks like he can wreak some havoc. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, so one of the things that when you're going through character creation, you have the, uh, the offensive side with like the one-handed weapons and the control frost. Then you also have some of your more support skills because, as we said, uh, a lot of our skills contribute towards conversation options yeah. in the game. So, like athletics, lore, and subterfuge play a part in how your character can affect conversations mm -hmm. at, with different NPCs. Like uh, being really good in one-handed weapons makes like when you actually get into combat, you're more effective. But having high athletics, lore, and subterfuge can mean you can avoid combats altogether or weaken them yeah. in some way through different options. So, so what you're saying is that there are less NPCs in the game that when in conversation are super impressed with your one-handed uh, weapon skill compared yes. to your lore. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, if they're not impressed in conversation and you attack them, they'll become impressed once you start actually yeah. wailing on them. So. No, but no one's like, oh, I, I, I see you. I uh, see you have a sword. Very nice. <laughs> Can you swing it around for me? I mean, this is a, you're part of an evil army, so everyone kind of has a sword. <laughs> like, not really that impressive. <sighs> okay, well... So I think that's most of what we can show from the character creation at the moment, right? Correct, yes. So mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we're going to keep the rest slightly secret still. We're wait, we'll reveal more at, at a later date, but this is what we're uh, showing here today. So we can get out to the uh, main menu again, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal, steal control for a short second here again so we can, so we can get back into this. Um, and talk... Uh, I thought we'd talk a bit about... Because... Tyranny is one like it's one of those RPGs that is because from the start you're basically evil. Mm -hmm. Like even if you don't want, I mean, I I tend to play the good guy even in even in games where there are choice. Right. I'm always like I'll I'll be the good guy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know I don't know how how you feel about that dynamic between good and evil. Like mm -hmm. is it what do you if you have a choice in game what do you norm do you do you also fall in the trap that you you tend to be good. Um. Usually I do tend to be good because the options are more... There's more options for yeah. a good player. A lot of games treat evil as like, oh, you're the psychopath who just goes mm -hmm. and attacks everybody. Yeah. And that just stops being interesting very quickly. So one of the challenges we had with Tyranny is how do we give you enough variety of evil options that it feels like you actually have choice and that they're interesting choices that aren't just killing people. So as we were designing our quests and our conversations, we really wanted to focus on giving you different ways to be the evil bastard but not just be the guy who pulls out a sword and starts attacking people every every five seconds. And so, have you guys noticed any difference in the dev team since you started working on Tyranny and everyone's starting contemplating different evil options compared to perhaps other games? So, our team is special. Um, <laughs> a lot of us came from the, the South Park Stick of Truth uh -huh. RPG. 
So we were already warped and twisted before Tyranny began. So, um, but one thing I have noticed is that a lot of the women on the development team are much more uh, willing to go for the evil option and embrace like the evil side. Like a lot of the guys are like, no, no, I'll go. I'll try to be good here. And they're like, no, kill him, kill him. Just execute him immediately. Put him on a spike. Like they just don't hold back, and it's a uh, an interesting dynamic to watch. Uh, let's let's see if we have something from from the stream. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure some some of this stuff, of course, you can't answer, and some of them I'm pretty sure are very tongue in cheek. Uh, but there are people that want to know about romance options. Uh, so we're not doing full romances, yeah. like uh, we're not not doing like a Bioware style mm -hmm. romance, sexy times game. Um, basically. You do have uh, you, there's interactions you can have with characters and that like, questions you can ask with them, yeah. but uh, in order to do romance as well, it requires a, a lot of like dedicated writing time to really develop characters mm -hmm. in that way. And with the demands we have with Tyranny already of doing between the different quest lines you can do based on your alliances with different characters and the, the multiple different ways you can choose to approach things, we're already doing like uh, we're in the middle of localizing the game, and we were well over seven hundred thousand words that we're <laughs> localizing. So we definitely did not have the budget yeah. to do add romance options on top of that. Well, I mean, I think I think the the more I guess for me personally interesting is uh, like uh, character dynamics between you and NPCs because mm -hmm. I assume there's there's going to be a lot of that. Yes. Uh, so pretty much every NPC that you talk to in the game, there's several different things they have to be aware of. They're basically um, what like choices you've made uh, during character creation and early in the game to shape the world, what choices you've made on quests up to this point, what your major alliances are, um, what choices you may have said with other faction members that have affected how they'd feel about you, plus like just various other, like, oh, you did made this choice on this quest, which I care about because it was dealing with my brother, so I have to respond to it in some way. Like... Every conversation is this massive yeah. web of just different states to check for. So there is a lot of reactivity and uh, choice and consequence in the game. Like um, one of the things we're going we're doing now is we're playing through the game more and more is trying to like identify all the places where oh you make choice A and then choice B we don't pay off on that so we have to like add some reactivity mm -hmm. there and like trying to find all of those now that we can uh, possibly can so that people who are playing through the game are really going to feel like. Yeah, tyranny is paying off on every all the choices that I've made so far. But I guess that also means that once like the game isn't really over if you've done one playthrough. Correct. Yeah, tyranny. We, we designed the game to be one you can play multiple times. Like, um, so at the bare minimum, there are four major storylines yeah. through the game. But within each of those storylines, there's a lot of different permutations and vari variabilities. Like, um, one of our major quest lines, there are actually eight different possible playthroughs of that major quest mm -hmm. line just based on different choices you make in different areas of the game. Our QA has to put together this massive test plan for all the different paths of the game, all the different permutations of those paths, and how if you make uh, fail at a quest or make it the wrong choice, how you can then drop through to another path in the game. And it's a uh, massive amount of testing workload for them to do. So they love us. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we have some questions about engagement systems in combat. Okay. Uh, basically. Uh, yes, we do have engagement in combat. Um, people who've played Pillars are we familiar yeah. with the engagement system, and Tyranny works uh, very much the same way, where enemies uh, who have the right uh, like weapons and abilities can engage party members, and similarly party members can engage enemies. Um, and then based on that, if you try to move away from an enemy, you get a, a free attack against them with a de disengagement attack. Um, there are certain abilities that allow you to move freely um, to avoid being engaged or to break engagement for free without taking those, those free attacks. So basically it's something to, uh, as players are playing through the game, especially in a harder difficulty mode, something for them to be aware of and to use the right abilities to move their party members around and avoid uh, getting those, get, taking those free attacks. Or we have one of our characters who's very much about trying to uh, get as many people to engage him as possible. He has several abilities that actually become stronger the more people are engaging him. So it's actually like he draws people in to attack him and then he starts getting bonuses because they're engaging him and does massive damage as a result. So uh, we try to take the engagement system and for certain characters make it like a, a benefit. Mm -hmm. Like, they, oh, I want to be engaged as much as possible. 
<laughs> let's see. Let's see if we have. Uh, let's see if we have some. Well, there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of people that are uh, hailing Kairos. Do you do, <laughs> nice. you, do, do, do you recommend that as a as a strategy for for surviving? I mean, Kairos isn't really going to like Kairos more cares if you try and uh, use her name in vain. Yeah. Like hailing Kairos is fine. That that's great and everything. But if you break Kairos's laws or try to swear by uh, the overlord's name without holding up to it then you're going to get punished so it's, so it's basically you don't really want to be on her radar yes being unnoticed is the safest <laughs> of course it's also the way you don't get advancement that way so if you want if you're ambitious and want power you have to be noticed but then it becomes more deadly as a result uh-huh uh, oh, we have. You mentioned localization quickly. Mm -hmm. Do we do we have a set number of languages? It's uh, in yet? because so yeah, right now I believe uh, we're localizing. There's uh, six languages, including English. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've actually got uh, German. Oh, French. that's that's smart. Yes, uh, Spanish, French, <laughs> German, Polish, and Russian. There we go. Um, Okay, so there are uh, some people want to know uh, want to know the names of the people involved with the game's writing. Who do you have on your Who do you have on your staff who's been working on it? So our lead writer on the game is Matt McLean. Uh, he's been with Obsidian for a while. He's worked on uh, games like Alpha Protocol. He did some writing on Pillars of Eternity as well. Um, he was on uh, South Park Stick of Truth. Um, so he's lead writer on the game. Then we also have a writer named uh, Paul Kirsch. He did some work with Pillars of Eternity on their guidebook. Um, and did some work in game as well, and then he joined our team uh, over a year ago now. Wow, uh, time's flying. <laughs> um, we have a writer named Megan Starks. Uh, she's done a lot of work on our uh, Beastmen characters, one of our companions, and Robert Land, who's done both level design and writing for us. So, right now we've got four people on the writing team. That's typically more than we have for an Obsidian title, but with the, the amount of reactivity yeah. we have in the game, we kind of needed more writing bandwidth for the game. Okay, we have uh, Billy Corgan s uh, says uh, he has 210 hours on Pillars with two runs. And I guess the question is, how does Tyranny compare? We, we talked about how several playthroughs are yes. needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you say it's about, like, it's about the same? Would you get the same... So right now, our our estimate for like a, a single playthrough of the game is about 20 to 25 hours. Mm -hmm. That's someone who's probably focusing primarily on the crit path content. Um, we've had people doing playthroughs who are trying to like be completionists, do yeah. everything. And I think we had one designer do, was approaching like 40 hours um, for a single playthrough. And that's one of four major ones. Again, not including all the various minor permutations. Yeah. So you could easily sink hundreds of hours into the game if you wanted to be a completionist on all the possible yeah. quests. But I guess that's also one of the reasons... I mean, if you have a lot of different permutations, you kind of don't want the game to be... It's going to take too long to yes, get through exactly. it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if, if, uh, our, if one playthrough was 100 hours, no one would play it a second time yeah. <laughs> to get multiple playthroughs. <sighs> Oh, okay. So, uh, like I said, we've we've gone through the uh, character creation today. Mm -hmm. I know that you guys are basically. This is Wednesday. We're here uh, in Gamescom up till Friday. You've got meeting every day, all day, yes. basically. Yeah, uh, very full schedule. Yeah, and for for press and media, you have been showing more of the game. So mm -hmm. in in the in the coming weeks, there should be more articles coming out for those that are really. Uh, thirsty for more tyranny information, and of course, there's also the dev diaries yes. uh, mm -hmm. that are are they posted uh, biweekly now, monthly? Uh, every week? two weeks, yeah. yeah. See, I was I was like, yes, I'm correct. <laughs> that plus we have uh, beginning of every month we have a new short story that yeah. goes up that gives more information about the world of tyranny as well. So, and you can all find that on I think it's tyranny tyrannygame.com. Exactly. Game. Yeah, that's tyrannygame.com. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be it for uh, for now. Thank you so much Excellent. for uh, for talking to me and hanging out on stream. I'm sure you should uh, have some lunch. <laughs> That'd be good. Because <laughs> yes. uh, we, we realized today, oh, you're streaming during lunch. That'll be fun. Uh, but let's see if we have some. Let's see if we have one or, one or two final questions we can get through here, and then I'll let you uh, go. Um, uh well there you go 
Uh, <laughs> it's basically people that want to see more. Uh, but uh, we're not doing that because we're, uh, we're, we're keeping that for now. Um, but like I said, the, pl the plan was to do uh, um, uh, character creation. We've done that. So thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, and for you guys that are watching at home, we will be uh, back a bit later with Shams to talk about how to pitch games for Tyranny. And then I'm going to force one of you Obsidian guys to come back for the uh, Surviving Games Code talk show that we have in, in a few hours' time when everyone's really tired after a full day of Gamescom. Excellent. That'll be great. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. I'm going to see if we can find ourselves a standby screen here that we can uh, we can use for a, a bit and then we'll uh, stream some more stuff so yes thank you for coming thank, thank you for watching bye bye bye